All right, I think it's 11.15, uh, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mike Deck. I'm a Partner Solutions Architect at AWS. Uh, I specialize specifically in our serverless platform. Um, I'm also going to be joined by Andy Warzen, who's the uh, CTO at Trek 10. He's going to be giving you guys a demo uh, here at the, at the end of the talk. Um, and yeah, today we're going to be talking about uh, the, the AWS serverless platform and, and kind of some of the specifics about uh, how to implement CI/CD and, and DevOps practices within the context of serverless architectures. So obviously, since we're talking about serverless, figured we'd start off talking about race cars. Um, so this is, uh, this is a race car that a buddy of mine and I used to own back before we had uh, wives and kids and, and when we had actual free time. Um, and you may notice that this, uh, this particular car has a little bit of an interesting paint job. It looks a little weird. If you were to look at the hood, you'd see that it's actually a, it's a mosaic of the state flag of Texas made out of beer bottle caps. And the reason for that is because we weren't racing in a normal, a normal uh, racing series. It was in uh, something called the 24 Hours of Lemons. And that's not just me mispronouncing Le Mans. This is actually a uh, racing series where you're only allowed to spend $500 on your car. Uh, so you've got to buy and fix up a car for $500 total. And then not only do you only get $500, but you've got to race for 24 hours straight overnight. <clears throat> uh, you start at noon on Saturday, race all the way until noon on Sunday, and the team that gets the most laps wins. Um, so, you know, my buddy and I were really excited. We got this car. We bought it for $500. We fixed it up. We brought it out to the racetrack. We were hoping we were going to spend 24 hours straight driving it with us, and, and we had several other teammates who were taking shifts. But unfortunately... That's not what happened. We spent most of our time in the pits trying to fix this car because every time we took it out, something else would go wrong, something else would break. Uh, so instead of spending all of our time actually driving and making laps and, and kind of uh, moving forward with our goal of winning this race, we, we spent a lot of time dealing with sort of the infrastructure. And the reason that I, that I tell this story is because I think that this really mirrors the reason why a lot of our customers are starting to move towards serverless approaches to building applications. Because you don't want to spend all of your time dealing with the underlying infrastructure, managing servers, managing all of these, these pieces that, that don't really matter to your customers. What you'd rather do is spend your time building value for your users and for your customers. So when you're building applications using traditional architectures, deploying them on top of servers, not only do you have to kind of build your differentiated business value application code and, and actually monitor and run the application itself, but you also have all of these other concerns around the infrastructure and the servers that you have to deal with in addition to that. And, and really it, it pulls your focus away from the things that, that really you care about, the things that are gonna build value. Um, and, and again, that's really kind of the benefit here of why we're seeing so much adoption uh, in, in the serverless space. So just real quick, I think a lot of people talk about serverless. It's kind of a buzzword these days, and, and there's a lot of people that have different sort of definitions around what it means. So when I say serverless, when we talk about AWS and the serverless platform that we provide, when we're talking about that word, what we mean is, is a few different things. First of all, there's no servers to manage. So that means you never have to worry about provisioning or creating or managing servers. You don't have to deal with any operating system patches. Uh, you don't have to deal with kind of the security vulnerabilities at that point. Um, we also mean that uh, the services scale flexibly. So instead of having to think about scaling in terms of total amount of RAM and total CPU power, you really look at it more in terms of the number of requests that you're serving uh, or the number of, of reads and writes that are being made to a database, for instance. Um, also, high availability and fault tolerance is baked into the services themselves. So you'll notice there's no checkbox on something like AWS Lambda or DynamoDB uh, to say, I want this to be high available, highly available. It just is. So there's no additional kind of uh, architecture or design or, or even configuration that you have to do in order to ensure that you're running on top of a highly available service. And then finally, the, this, this idea of no idle capacity, the idea that you only pay for what you use. And so now server utilization is no longer your problem because if you're not using it, you're not going to pay for it. Now, I think one other kind of important point to make is a lot of times people think about serverless and, and they really think about this, this idea of functions as a service and, and sort of conflate these two ideas. But really, I think it's important to note that, that serverless is about a lot more than just AWS Lambda or just being able to use uh, uh, functions as a service 
uh, type of platform. There's a number of different services that deal with things like data persistence, <clears throat> uh, messaging, queuing, API management, um, as well as the entire kind of build and release management process that all sort of come together to form this cohesive platform. Um, that, and really building serverless applications is a lot about how do you glue together all of these different services in order to, to create kind of a functional app. So AWS Lambda is definitely kind of a key cornerstone to that and it's very critical and really kind of what unlocked the ability to build full end-to-end -end serverless applications. Um, but it is just kind of one piece. And so when we kind of look at what does that start to look like, you know, you start to see people building things like web applications now without servers. So you're using S3 to handle kind of the static website hosting and then you're using API Gateway to manage the front end REST API with Lambda on the back end serving as that, that actual logic layer communicating with something like DynamoDB. Similarly, we can look at a streaming data kind of processing architecture um, where you've got maybe IoT devices on the front end sending data into something like Kinesis uh, that's then getting processed by Lambda and, and integrating with things like DynamoDB and S3 to, to kind of store that state. Um, so the point of this talk isn't to necessarily get into all of these different serverless architectures and talk about the architecture point, um, the architectural concepts, um, but rather let's let's talk about assuming you are building serverless applications. What does that look like from a DevOps perspective? And really, you know, what changes from kind of your traditional DevOps environment that you that you're all used to? We're all here at DevOps World. Presumably everyone's very familiar with these kind of concepts. So what really changes when you move from, okay, we've got server-based deployments to now we're going to this serverless world. And the way I like to answer that is to start off with talking about, okay, well, what doesn't change? Because as it turns out, there's a lot of things that stay the same. And that's really, I think, one of the key themes here is that even though serverless represents a very sort of powerful shift in paradigm and in business model and in the way that you, you pay and operate um, applications, there's actually a lot of similarities in the way that you actually build and deploy them. Um, and, and a lot of the practices and uh, processes that we've developed over the last few decades in software and development and operations really stay the same. And I think it's important to kind of understand how that mapping works. So, you know, when you look at things like IDEs, version control, build tools, how are we building our software and, and how are we testing it? How are we ensuring code quality? As well as just all of the actual kind of practices and processes from a software engineering perspective for, for how do you design and write good high quality code? All of that stuff stays the same. We're not changing anything about that. Um, and really kind of the differences that we'll talk about here end up being uh, relatively superficial and, and really in some cases just minor changes to kind of the tooling that you use uh, in order to accomplish the same thing. So one of the things that does change that I want to start talking about is, is how you manage deployments. So traditionally in you know, uh, CICD kind of pipelines, that's obviously a very important component of that. How do we actually push the code from this point where, all right, it's checked into our version control system, it needs to get built, now we gotta actually get it out there in production so users can use it. Um, the process of going from, okay, I've got this sort of code to now it's a deployable artifact and now it's actually out there running is one of those areas that's a little bit different with serverless than it is in kind of a traditional environment. Um, so taking a look at, at AWS Lambda specifically, um, if we look at kind of the steps that it takes to go and deploy a new function within this platform, uh, there's a few different steps. So first of all, you gotta build your code the same way you always would. Then you zip it up, you upload it to S3, um, and then at that point, you're gonna have to create an IAM role for your function to assume, and, and then go and, and actually create the function itself and then set up any kind of event uh, mappings and, and management from that perspective so that the, the code can actually run. <clears throat> If you then kind of add on to this kind of these additional services like API Gateway and DynamoDB, now there's, there's even additional sort of steps where, where you would go through and, and kind of manage the API itself, configure any resources and methods at that level, as well as provision your database and, and kind of the back end there. And so you start to look at this and, and they're starting to get to be a few steps here that we've got to manage. Um, but you know, that shouldn't be a big deal. Again, we're at, we're at a DevOps conference. People are all about automation, right? We can definitely automate this. This is just deploying AWS resources. So, you know, a, a classic tool for addressing these types of scenarios where I've got a lot of AWS resources that I need to, 
to create and manage would be to use CloudFormation, right? So uh, AWS CloudFormation is our infrastructure as code service that helps kind of deploy and manage AWS resources. And if you were to look at uh, the template for how to deploy kind of the the application that I was showing just a second ago, um, you'd see it's, it's kind of a long template. There's a lot of resources that have to be sort of created and, and independently specified within this, within this template. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty confident that anyone in this room could go out and write this template for the first time. Um, you know, within a few minutes, it probably wouldn't be that hard. It's mostly copying and pasting, but to maintain this over time and when new people come onto your team and need to be able to read this and understand what it's doing, that starts to get really tedious and, and really burdensome. Um, so in order to address that, we created something called the serverless application model. So AWS SAM, as we refer to it, is a, a layer on top of CloudFormation that allows you to specify serverless applications in a much more concise way. So kind of looking at a concrete example of that, this is the SAM version of that same template we were just looking at. So this is defining the exact same kind of API where now instead of having to define the function and the role and the API and the resource and the methods and all of these things independently, I can now define my one function and say, okay, I want this function, here's where the code lives, and here are the specific kind of API resources that I want this code to run in response to. Um, and configure that all together and, and define it in this very sort of concise template that I can now use to repeatedly deploy this application over and over again um, on top of, of CloudFormation. So just to give you guys a quick overview of sort of what SAM is specifically, there's really kind of two components that, that, that SAM provides. The first is a CLI that runs kind of locally on your laptop. Uh, and the other is, is an extension that actually runs inside of the CloudFormation service itself. Um, so the same, oh, excuse me. Uh, so the same CLI, its job in this whole sort of deployment story is really to manage that kind of packaging um, process where you've got to zip up all of your code and, and, and get it ready for Lambda to actually accept. So the same CLI allows you to just specify within your template kind of a local um, directory within your sort of version control system of where, where that code or that, that, that build artifact lives that's going to end up powering your Lambda function. And so instead of managing kind of, okay, how do I take that and get it up to S3 and make sure that I've, I'm you know, managing versions and everything, the SAM CLI is responsible for doing that. So it'll create the zip file the way that it needs to, get it uploaded to S3 and then update your template so now you've got a template pointing to a specific version of your code in S3. So now you've got this immutable sort of build artifact that you can use to stamp out the exact same version of this serverless application over and over again. Um, so then once you have that template and everything's been uploaded to S3, you can now take that and deploy that using the standard CloudFormation service uh, integrations that, that you're used to. Um, there's really no difference at that point between deploying a SAM template and deploying a standard CloudFormation template. You can include all of the same resources, uh, non-serverless resources as well as serverless resources inside of the same template and CloudFormation will take care of kind of managing that deploy for you. And under the covers what's happening is it's actually transforming those serverless specific resources, kind of that shorthand version that I showed you a minute ago, and it's actually transforming that into an explicit kind of raw CloudFormation template that has all of the individual resources sort of uh, explicitly defined. But again, you don't really have to manage that yourself. That's all sort of handled under the covers for you. Um, so now if we go back and take a look at this kind of process that we looked at earlier for how do we deploy kind of a full serverless API, instead of having these, you know, 10 different steps that you've got to, that you've got to uh, do manually, it turns into this two-step process of, okay, we can package our application up using SAM CLI, and then uh, it's one step to then deploy it out to an actual AWS uh, environment. <clears throat> so now, you know, let's take a look at how, how does this kind of new concept impact, uh, you know, delivery pipelines, because that's kind of really the key that we're trying to get to, is how does this impact our, our sort of automation model um, from a DevOps perspective and, and how we're building and deploying our software. So looking at a very sort of overly simplified version of a, a CI CD pipeline, um, you know, you've got sort of your standard, we're gonna build the code and this would include testing and verifying and, and running 
you know, unit tests and any kind of code quality metrics that you want, then typically you're going to want to deploy to stage or some test environment, run some integration tests perhaps, and then finally deploy it out to production. This exact same pipeline, the exact same way that you would do it today for, uh, you know, for a standard kind of traditional application getting deployed to servers is, is exactly the same structure that you would use for a serverless application. Um, but in this case, you would use all of your standard existing tools exactly the same way for kind of the build and test phases. And then AWS SAM is, is kind of what you would plug into the deployment phases to make sure that, that um, the application is getting deployed in a standard repeatable kind of way. So now that we've got this kind of mechanism that we can plug into our pipelines to do deployments, Let's take a look at how do we kind of manage these various environments that we need to be pushing our, our code out into. Um, so one of the first things that, that we always talk to customers about when we talk about environment management is, you know, segregating your production environment from, from kind of the rest of your environments, right? So um, AWS has a really nice kind of feature where you can create multiple accounts. Uh, they can live underneath an organization. Um, I'm not going to get into kind of all of the details about account governance and things like that, but, but the key thing to, to kind of understand is that an AWS account gives you this really nice kind of isolation boundary um, that really makes a lot of sense in a serverless world. And because, again, in, in a serverless uh, architecture, you don't pay for idle, it makes it really easy to kind of create multiple accounts and, and spread out your different environments into different accounts. You don't have to worry about like, am I utilizing all of the resources that I've provisioned? You know, do I have servers out there that are running idle? Do I need to kind of consolidate workloads onto a single um, cluster? You, you can actually kind of manage that across accounts very easily and have you know, uh, the, the same kind of economic model that you would even if you were consolidating everything into a single account. So what that means is that typically what you do is you'd have kind of a production account and then a separate account for your test or stage environment. Um, and you would set your, your build pipelines up to, uh, to manage the deployments into each of these accounts for these different stages. So when I do my kind of initial build and push it out to a stage environment before I run my integration tests, that's gonna go into one account, one AWS account, and then I'm gonna use a completely separate isolated AWS account to push um, my production system to. Um, and what this gives you the ability to do is, is isolate the users that have access. So potentially on this test account, maybe you give your developers uh, you know, an increased level of access for them to be able to go in and, and poke around and, and debug and, and um, inspect what's going on in those systems. Whereas in the production account, you keep it very, very locked down. Um, you may not even have any actual human user access enabled by default in that production account. Everything is only allowed to get there through kind of your automated pipelines, for instance. And, and because you have that account isolation boundary set up, it's very easy to set that up and keep kind of those two uh, permission sets isolated from one another. Um, now, that doesn't always make sense to have sort of this one-to-one -one mapping between accounts and environments. Um, in many cases, you are going to want to use a shared account and have multiple versions of a particular application or multiple environments for a single service deployed to a single account. But again, because SAM lives on top of uh, CloudFormation, that makes it really easy to kind of stamp out multiple, event, multiple environments within the same account. So CloudFormation would allow you to deploy that exact same SAM template that was built using the CLI multiple times within the same account. So now I can have different services and different versions of that same service living inside of one kind of shared account. Um, now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to have separate accounts for you know, dev and stage and, and even giving individual developers their own sandbox accounts. In fact, some of our most sophisticated customers do exactly that. They actually have every single individual developer has their own entirely isolated sandbox account where they can go try things out, don't have to worry about accidentally stepping on anyone else's toes. Um, and that's a great model to use if you have the organizational maturity to be able to manage accounts at that scale. Um, so if you've got all the automation set up to do, to set up kind of the security controls and you know, log management, access management, and auditing um, across kind of accounts at scale, then by all means, create separate accounts for everything that you do. Um, and then just sort of you know, point your templates to those various accounts. However, some of our customers are still sort of building that maturity um, and creating new accounts is not necessarily a trivial thing for them to do. Um, and, and so in those cases, it, it's absolutely possible to be very successful using a single kind of shared non-prod account 
uh, to deploy kind of all of these other um, all of these other environments. Um, and because of the way that CloudFormation works, as long as you're letting CloudFormation sort of manage the physical names and physical IDs of, of the resources that you're creating inside of your templates, um, it'll avoid any kind of naming collisions and things like that. And, and it, uh, it makes it pretty easy to create these isolated environments even inside of a single account. Um, so looking at that and, and kind of taking another step further with it, uh, one of the things that's really unique about serverless is, is some of the cool things that now you can do with uh, how, you manage a how you manage environments at at kind of the feature and bug fix branch level. So, you know, we work with a lot of customers who have kind of Git repositories that are structured, maybe something like this. Again, everyone's got sort of a different flavor of this. So uh, this, is, this is kind of a, a generified version. Um, but in a lot of cases, people have got, you know, a master and a development branch maybe, and then uh, individual developers will create feature branches that, that are these ephemeral branches that live for a short amount of time as they're working on an individual feature or bug fix. Um, and, and typically what we see is that customers usually only have pipelines set up to actually deploy their master and development branches kind of by default. So every single commit that gets pushed into one of these branches will get built automatically and pushed out to an environment, whether that's your production or, or some sort of test environment. But then oftentimes these feature branches don't sort of get automatedly built every single time there's a new commit pushed. And the reason for that is it's, that starts to get really expensive. If you've got dozens of feature branches that are out there in, in development at any given time, and you've got to deploy an entirely separate environment for every single one of those, you're going to have a lot of servers sitting around not doing much because you probably don't have a QA team that's constantly hitting every one of these feature branches. And so you wait until someone really needs to demo one of these, and then you push it out to some custom branch or there's some manual process there. Um, but the cool thing with serverless is because, again, you don't pay for idle, it makes it completely feasible now to automatically set up every time a new branch is created, automatically create a new pipeline and have that push out to, to a new um, environment that just sort of lives for as long as that branch lives. And then when those branches finally get merged and closed out, that environment gets cleaned up on the back end. Um, so we've got a number of customers that are starting to do this and have found that it really gives them a, an advantage because now anytime a developer has a question about, hey, yeah, I'm working on this feature branch and, uh, you know, the, the, the user story you wrote said this, but I'm not entirely sure. Well, why don't you go check it out real quick? Here's the URL to the thing and it was already built and it's already set up and it's already ready to go. Um, and so that really kind of reduces the amount of time that it takes to, to co kind of collaborate on, on the, the development and see what's happening and, and giving broader visibility to the rest of the organization during the development process. Um, so the last kind of uh, core feature, I guess, that I, that I wanted to talk about is, is kind of the, the concept of change management. So um, this is another kind of piece of the, of the puzzle that, that oftentimes um, customers, as they get more uh, comfortable with uh, kind of the DevOps model, they, they also want to ensure that uh, they've got the appropriate kind of governance in place, both from a security perspective as well as just looking at, you know, wanting to understand um, what changes are being made to their various different environments. And so how do you kind of manage that? And, and um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of different things that, that people are typically looking for um, in, a, in a kind of a change management process. One is just general visibility into what changes are being made. You know, want to understand before we actually go and roll out something into our production environment, what's going to change? Which functions am I changing? Are there updates to our database? Are there other resources that are going to, to be impacted when I roll this out? Um, also kind of a separation of duties, so enabling you to have uh, you know, your development teams that are actually building new features and, and, and kind of proposing these changes, if you will, separate from another group that's doing a review on those changes to ensure that, uh, that, that what's being pushed out meets all of the sort of quality standards and, and policies and other kind of internal governance. Um, then also having kind of to, to tie into that, you know, a workflow set up internally so that, uh, so that you have this mechanism to, to get the appropriate approvals so that you're Development teams can iterate very quickly kind of inside of their own test environments and things like that. But then once you start pushing things out to uh, production and getting closer to those kind of deployments, um, there are additional kind of eyes on, on what's happening and, and making sure that you're um, getting the, the appropriate sign off before those changes go live. 
Um, and then the last piece is kind of auditability oftentimes, right? So wanting to be able to have this very strict record of exactly what changed, when, cha when it changed, and who was responsible for kind of pushing that out. Um, <clears throat> and so the way that we see a lot of customers kind of achieving this within the context of serverless applications is taking advantage of, of a cloud formation feature called change sets. So again, because AWS SAM lives on top of, you know, is, is just a layer on top of CloudFormation, you get all of the full kind of power and feature set that CloudFormation offers out of the box. Um, and, and so, so yeah, so using change sets, you can kind of achieve all of these. So the way that this kind of looks is, first of all, you start off with some application that's been deployed out into your production environment, let's say, um, represented kind of over on the left side with this, you know, deployed application stack. Um, so then you, you might have a developer create you know, a new feature, update something, maybe there's a new function that needs to be added as part of this or a change to one of your existing API methods. Um, so instead of just deploying that directly or having your pipeline go and automatically push that change out just because the code was committed, um, what would happen first is you would create a change set within the CloudFormation service itself. Um, so again, this would be part of your standard SAM workflow. You'd define the template, you would update any code or update the configuration that's defined in that SAM template itself, um, and then update the uh, update within CloudFormation, create this change set. So that's not actually going to impact your deployed application. It's simply going to create this sort of manifest of what is going to change if you were to apply this. Then you can have another team, um, you know, or potentially someone else on the same team, review those changes, kind of uh, review that, that everything is as it should be, um, make sure that there's nothing uh, that you're pushing out that, that's in violation of any internal policies or uh, that's going to cause you know, destructive changes that you're not expecting. Um, and then once that review is complete, they can go and say, all right, now this change set is ready to be executed. And then finally, let CloudFormation kind of handle the, the final execution of that. Um, so again, just another kind of interesting feature of the fact that you know, now that you've got this coalescence of, uh, of the code deployment itself, being able to actually deploy your application along with kind of the, how you're managing the infrastructure components itself because there's not this separate infrastructure layer that you're responsible for managing. Um, in addition to that, you can now sort of use all of these kind of tools in one atomic operation to be able to, to go and deploy all of these changes to your application um, and manage that the same way that you would typically manage kind of just the, the changes to your infrastructure itself. Um, so with all of that being said, you know, we talked a lot about how AWS SAM sort of integrates into the serverless deployment lifecycle and how this can be integrated into uh, your delivery pipelines and a CI CD workflow. Um, and so Today, what we would like to, uh, to kind of show you guys is something that we've been working on in collaboration with Trek 10, which is a new AWS SAM Jenkins plugin. Um, so this allows you to use SAM templates within your, uh, to define your application and uh, easily configure Jenkins pipelines to, to do deployments using SAM. Um, so you can check it out. It's on uh, GitHub today. It's, it's been uh, forked into the Jenkins CI organization. Uh, we are kind of working through the final uh, approvals to get the, uh, the last deployment done, um, but that should be ready in the next couple of days. So we definitely encourage you guys to take a look at that. And uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy from Check10 to, to give you guys a demo of the new plugin. All right, thanks Mike. Um, so, like Mike said, uh, Andy Warzon, I'm with uh, AWS partner called Trek10. Uh, we have a focus in serverless infrastructure or serverless DevOps. Uh, so, we've collaborated uh, with AWS to build this plugin. So, uh, now that you've heard some of the concepts from Mike about serverless and serverless DevOps, I'm going to get a little bit more hands on and show you, uh, demystify hopefully a little bit of what it actually takes to build a SAM project um, and now to use this plugin to uh, to deploy that project with Jenkins. Um, so hopefully you'll see from this that you know there are a few parts that are new um, in SAM and this plugin hopefully make that as easy as possible, but a lot of this will mirror what you're used to today with uh, existing application development. Hopefully you'll see those parallels as much as possible here and uh, can walk away from this really ready to, uh, to try this out yourself. Okay, so uh, we're gonna start with the project here. So this is, uh, um, this is a simple project that uh, 
is actually from an example from, so AWS SAM GitHub repo has a great set of examples. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you're just trying to get started, need a little inspiration. Uh, there are a lot of good examples of different runtime environments, different architectures. Uh, this example is um, an architecture that you saw uh, on the slides earlier of a simple API uh, microservice with an API gateway endpoint, a Lambda function to process the request, and then a DynamoDB backend to store a little data. So a simple little example, but actually pretty close to a real world. So um, this, uh, this template uh, describes that. So uh, you can see if you've used CloudFormation, it looks very similar. It's this YAML format. This, this line here tells us that this is a SAM template, which means I can use both regular CloudFormation in this and uh, these uh, SAM goodies that you get um, on top. So um, a first, first one of those goodies is the idea of a global attribute. So this is a nice way to make your template more concise. You can define attributes that, that will apply uh, to everything in the template. So in my case, classic example of this, uh, all of my functions are going to be Python, so I can define that up here. Um, I can also define environment variables. So um, your Lambda function ca can, uh, of course, accept environment variables passed in. And um, you know, those variables might be defined elsewhere in the template, right? So here I'm going to create a, a DynamoDB table. And the name of that table will be passed in as an environment variable into my, into my function. Um, and a few other settings there. Uh, the next, next section of this is really key for uh, doing DevOps properly, right? You saw the, the, you know, wanted the idea of wanting to manage the different stages with the same template. So parameters are important to do that, uh, to, to be able to vary different things that are going to be different from production to dev. A uh, classic example of that would be DynamoDB throughput here, right? So I'm going to have a low number for, for dev and then be able to set that high for, for my production environment. Um, so again, this is a CloudFormation feature, but you can also use it in SAM and it's important to use. Uh, the next step after that is resources. Uh, so this is kind of the meat of the template. Here you can define any AWS, uh, any AWS service that supports CloudFormation can be defined here. Um, but then we also have these additional serverless resources, basically, that, are, uh, that we get with the serverless application model, or SAM. Uh, the first one of those is a serverless function. So this is, uh, again, a simplified Lambda function. Uh, and the key part of this is this, uh, is this handler and code URI section. So this is telling... Uh, this, the SAM template, your entry point into your Lambda function, right? So, uh, so with Lambda, um, you, uh, AWS defines a specification for an input event. So an event triggers Lambda, and you have a JSON payload that's input into that. And then in some cases, you also have a response that you have to give back to the, uh, the service that invoked you. And so the AWS defines that specification, and you have to have a handler function around your Lambda code uh, that, that matches that specification. Uh, but and so this points to the plus spot in your code where that, uh, where that handler function exists. Uh, but after you've defined that function, that handler, that's really just a wrapper. Everything else underneath that can really be like it typically is in your application. So uh, it's, it's actually a lot lighter layer on an application than, than, you, might, uh, than you might be thinking. Uh, and everything else really, really is very similar. So you can have, in this case, I've got handler functions here. Um, I I've, I've, uh, can then have... Uh, Shared libraries, so I can have multiple functions maybe that have some shared libraries, just like you would in a normal application. Uh, I've got, I can install my dependencies with a requirements file for Python. I can have unit tests. Uh, everything else really feels like a, a, a normal application. It's just that this handler function is wrapped on top, and, uh, and the SAM template points to the entry point for that handler function. Um, so then a couple other settings here that we'll skip over and get to the event sections. This is the next, the second key piece that we're building. Um, so uh, you can define basically implicitly, uh, you can define your events that are trigger that Lambda function and then Sam figures out the AWS resources that need to be created to define that event. So in this case, we're going to define an API gateway endpoint um, and give it the path and the HTTP methods for it. And then the third piece of this is the uh, DynamoDB table. So uh, you saw Mike show this earlier, there's this concept of a serverless simple table, which basically just creates a DynamoDB table with some kind of uh, sensible defaults for you. You can just those two lines of YAML is all you actually need to do it. Um, but then you can set overrides. In my case, um, you know, I've set the throughput um, to refer to that parameter uh, for, from earlier in the template. Um, if this isn't enough for you, by the way, if this doesn't give you enough control, you, remember you can always go back to uh, raw CloudFormation. So I could define a DynamoDB table, for example, with any of the configuration I need in there or any other, any other service that I want to use to store my state for this, for this example. And then finally, the last key piece is outputs. So, um, you know, in my case, I want to know the URL uh, for the API gateway endpoint that's created. Um, you know, I might want to pass that to, a, to another service that's going to call my microservice here. 
Um, you can also do something interesting with outputs uh, with a, a feature called stack exports that CloudFormation offers. So you can uh, basically take an output from one stack and, um, and use that as a, uh, you can import that output to a second stack. So you can imagine you can start to create much more complex uh, architectures or multi-stack architectures that tie together with stack exports using this out outputs feature. Um, so that's the basics of the template. Let's actually jump into uh, Jenkins now and see what it looks like to use this plugin to, to actually build a project. So um, I've got a simple kind of classic cooking show style example here. It's mostly pre-baked. Um, so we can um, skip the boring parts and uh, just get into the, uh, the new things with Sam. So um, basic, basic Jenkins job here with, uh, where I'm checking out from Git, of course. And then I'm doing my build. Uh, one unique thing that I'm doing with the build that I want to point out uh, that's, a, I think, a really good practice um, with any time you're working with Lambda. So um, you often, of course, have uh, parts of your build that are OS dependent. In my case, I'm going to be installing Python requirements that compile to the OS. So you actually want to use an environment that is closely matched to Lambda as possible. Um, this Docker container uh, is sort of becoming the standard for that. Uh, it's really well maintained. AWS actually uses it in the SAM CLI. So if you run the SAM CLI, you can invoke Lambda locally. It actually downloads the same container for that. So um, it's a really well-maintained container that tries to match a Lambda environment as closely as possible. There's versions for every Lambda runtime, Python in my case. Um, and there's also versions that uh, include build tools. So it's really ready to go, really easy to use. Um, so I'd really encourage you to use that if you're doing any sort of non-trivial build with your Lambda function. But then you can see, and this is where hopefully things start to look really familiar, that at, once I'm using that right container, I can do everything else just like normal, right? So I'm going to install my Python requirements just like I normally would. Uh, I can run unit tests. Uh, anything else you would do in a normal build, you can do just like normal here um, with, the, with your Jenkins project, uh, with, your, with your SAM project. Um, and then after that step, so this is where uh, we get to the plugin. So now we can add with this plugin, we have a, a basically a new option in the build steps. Uh, section here to deploy a SAM application. So I'll add that really quick and show you what that looks like to, um, to fill this out. So it um, starts with credentials. So um, really brief a moment about, uh, this is AWS IAM credentials. Uh, this is using the standard Jenkins AWS credentials provider. So if you're interacting with AWS already in Jenkins, uh, it's going to use the same, all the same features and limitations that that apply. Uh, there are a few permissions that this plugin needs. Um, that are documented, um, but more generally, this uh, the plugin is essentially going to need permission to create all of this, all of the resources defined in your SAM template, right? So that can be pretty significant uh, permissions. Really encourage you to not just you know give it admin permission to move on. Really make sure you understand what's going on in IAM using least permission um, to uh, and and all the other features of IAM to make that as secure as possible. Uh, one thing I will point out that's a nice uh, nice feature that this plugin supports that can help you do that is something called stack roles. So the stack roles is a CloudFormation uh, feature that basically lets you, instead of uh, having the permissions yourself to create the resources, you can uh, just uh, tell Cloud, the CloudFormation service about an IAM role that it will use on your behalf to create the, ser to create the uh, resources. So uh, you still have to have permission to tell the CloudFormation service to do that. That's called pass role. Uh, but it's, it creates a nice separation. Um, where you don't have directly the permission to create those services. Uh, all you do is have permission to tell the CloudFormation service to create those services. So this plugin uh, supports that feature. Uh, it's called it's the role arm down here. Um, so I'd encourage you to check that out to, uh, to make your, your setup as, as uh, secure as possible. All right, so then we'll fill in a couple other uh, simple examples here, uh, or simple uh, things here. We have to create a stack name. Uh, this plugin will create a new stack if it doesn't exist, or if it exists, it'll update the existing stack. Um, you also have to give it a uh, an S3 uh, bucket. So um, it will create the bucket if it doesn't exist, but it has to have a bucket to upload the code to. Um, and like with S3, as many of you know, I'm sure a bucket uh, name has to be globally unique. And then I have to tell it the name of my uh, template file. Uh, this is that was at the root of my project. Um, and that file can be named anything. Uh, you just have to tell it right here what that file is. And then I've set my parameters here. So this is the, uh, the parameter you saw at the throughput. See if I got that right. Um, this is the parameter that you saw set at the beginning of the template. So you can define all your parameters here. Then there are a couple other advanced features. Um, you can tag and a few other things that I won't go into now. Um, but that's it. Basically, just a couple settings to, uh, uh, to, to use that plugin to get it ready to actually deploy 
um, to AWS. So again, typical build steps, everything you would, you would do in a Jenkins job normally, um, uh, just make sure you use that Docker plugin or that, that, that Docker container to emulate Lambda and then, um, and then you use the plugin to do the, the SAM deploy step. So let's actually see what this looks like. We'll see if we have the demo gremlins or if this actually works, but let um, me show you what's actually happening here. So typical things, again, installing dependencies, running unit tests, and then we get to where uh, the SAM stuff is happening. Well, that's not too easy to read, but um, bear with me. Uh, I'll just show you a little bit about what the plugin is doing. These are all the things behind the scenes that it's doing that Mike mentioned earlier that kind of would be painful to have to chain together yourself. So it's packaging up the code, uh, uploading that test three, um, and it's creating an output template, so modifying the template to tell it where the S3 artifact is, and then it's creating that change set, and then, uh, and then once that change set is created successfully, it's executing that change set. So uh, let's actually go into CloudFormation in the console and see if this actually worked. And there we go. So it's uh, actually creating our, uh, creating our stack for us. Uh, so you can see the template here. Um, it's kind of interesting. You can see both the original SAM template and as Mike mentioned, CloudFormation translates this into a raw CloudFormation template. And so it's, it's kind of ugly there, but that's actually the, the original, the, the raw cloud formation that, get, that the cloud formation service builds out for you. You can inspect that. Um, you can see the resources here that started to create. It hasn't created all of them, but um, let me give it a second. Uh, there we go. It's creating more of an API gateway. We have our DynamoDB table, our Lambda function, some permissions. Um, and then it's kind of interesting to go in here actually and see what happens in Lambda. So if this pulls up, um, the Lambda, uh, the service will package up the code for you, and um, there we go. So uh, you can see what this actually looks like. So uh, this is what the Lambda function actually sees when it runs. It has your handler function that, that we created earlier. Uh, that's really tiny, but you can get the idea. Um, and again, a shared libraries would be here. And then it's installed all my dependencies as well. So you see I've got my vendored folder and all my Python dependencies. So again, you can feel, it feels a lot like a normal application development. You can keep your project just like you normally would and let Sam and this uh, plugin sort of do all the heavy lifting for you. So, uh, so that's all we had. Um, hopefully this gives you a little bit of sense of how, how you can uh, now go do this yourself. Um, we'd, uh, you know, we'd love for people to check out the plugin uh, once it gets listed. Uh, you saw the links there for uh, the GitHub project. Love to get issues and, and we'd love to any pull requests or questions you have. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, we'll be around uh, up front if anyone's got any questions uh, afterwards. So, thanks. Appreciate your time.